um, the next part of our presentation is probably one of the most anticipated discussion about therapeutic roles of um, ercidicolic uh, acid um, and VANCO and PSC. Um, and we will start that discussion from ERSO, our first speakers on a counterpoint point discussion on ERSO are Dr. Christopher Bordas and Dr. Aperna, Aperna Gold. Um, Dr. Bordas doesn't really need introduction to this group. However, um, you know that he has lifelong career dedication in the care of patients with autoimmune liver diseases and enormous contribution uh, to the field of cholangiopathy. He does wear many hats internationally as well as nationally. Um, and in addition to that, he is the co-chair of the PSC Partners Medical Advisory Board and the medical lead of the PSC Partners Registry. Dr. Bolas is the uh, Chief of Medicine at UC Davis Medical Center, and I will leave the stage to you, Chris. Thank you, Kittis. Uh, let me get my slides up here real quick. So I think the next several talks hopefully will be um, uh, illuminating, uh, stimulate some discussion, but I think there's also the, uh, some similarities discussing, you know, religion or politics at the dinner table. I think <laughs> there are certain feelings on both sides of these issues, and the reason why there are strong feelings on both sides and not any, you know, right or wrong answer is because we have incomplete data. So I, want, I, I hope that, you know, the reason for bringing this out is that uh, I kind of like those discussions about religion and politics is we may not change each other's minds, but we'll come away with an appreciation of what the issues are, what the differences are, and, and why we have these uh, unresolved questions, both about the, the, the use of Urso as well as vancomycin. So I, uh, I get to talk about why you should not take Urso, and I want to just give a little disclaimer that um, what I'm going to present here are the arguments for this side against Urso, while I do prescribe Urso to many of my patients. So <laughs> I'll try not to be too convincing. So when we talk about using a medication, I think it's very important that we understand that our, our default position is that the drug is guilty until proven innocent. We should not be using a drug until it is safe and effective. Um, and it's gotta be proven to be safe and effective. And where we set that bar of, of proof uh, can be variable depending on lots of different issues. For example, if we're talking about a drug for a cancer, we'll take a lot of safety risk and maybe not so much effectiveness proof to take a chance on that drug. Whereas if we're talking about a chronic illness, the, a drug has to be taken over a long period of time and there's not an immediate risk of morbidity or mortality, <clears throat> it needs to be very safe and demonstrate effectiveness. So I think that's very important to, to, to keep in mind. Now all, all medications have, or all treatments, whether it's a medication or otherwise, have risk and adverse effects. So no drug, even supplements, even natural products, have some risk. And it's often hard to measure that risk. And even in medications that are studied in clinical trials where adverse effects are monitored very closely, those are generally short-term effects that we're looking for. And long-term effects can occur much later during the course of treatment. Some examples are Celebrex, you know, the COX-2 inhibitor that was approved for therapy and later found to increase the risk of cardiovascular de uh, deaths. Same thing if you think about proton pump inhibitors, omeprazole, protonix, all these things that you know, probably half the room here has been taking. <clears throat> we've been using these things for over two decades, and it's only recently that we've discovered that there are potentially some risk, and even there it's not completely resolved. Um, but I, I just want to point out that there are known and unknown risk about, uh, with any medication. And then in terms of actually demonstrating a benefit, it should have a real benefit uh, for the patient, not just changing the lab tests. Um, improving liver tests is not a benefit. So what the FDA has said is for a new drug to be approved, there has to be substantial evidence from appropriately designed and analyzed trials. 
and it's got to demonstrate an improvement in how a patient feels, functions, or survives. If it doesn't meet any of those three metrics, there's really no reason to take a medication. And so after 20 years of study, we still have not met that standard for URSO. So you might argue that, well, URSO improves liver tests, and PSC patients with lower liver tests, alkaline phosphatase in particular, live longer. So doesn't this mean, then, that if URSO lowers liver tests, if I take URSO, it'll make me live longer? Well, not necessarily. There are lots of studies in other fields of medicine that show that even improving something that's associated with a better outcome does not necessarily mean you're going to get a benefit. In fact, there's evidence in some trials of the opposite. So a classic study had to do with heart arrhythmias following um, a heart attack. Many deaths after heart attacks are due to arrhythmias. And there's a classic study where they use antiarrhythmics uh, in patients after heart attacks. And in fact, it did reduce the rate of non-lethal arrhythmias. But in fact, people that took the antiarrhythmic did worse. They had a higher mortality. So just because we're improving what we call a surrogate marker doesn't necessarily mean it's going to translate into uh, better uh, outcomes. Now, I think this is an important uh, point to make here uh, with, with URSO. Oops, excuse me. So what we want to think URSO is doing is that, say we have two patients, both starting at the same point in their disease process, and they have an alkaline phosphatase that's elevated. The patient on top doesn't take URSO and continues to speed along this trajectory. The alkaline phosphatase actually continues to increase on its way to getting a very sick liver. The, the same patient starting at the same time speeding along, but then once they start taking URSO, they slow down. They start walking or maybe walking backwards, maybe moonwalking a little bit. Um, so anyway, their alkaline phosphatase comes down uh, and they no longer progress to that end stage sick liver. That's what we want to think is happening with URSO. What, I, what we have to be careful of is this scenario, which is uh, honestly, I think, the more likely scenario. The patient on top actually isn't starting at the same point. The patient on top is actually has a head start on that path to a sick, sick liver. And when they take the URSO, it has no effect. The alkaline phosphatase stays elevated, and they continue to speed along. This patient, they take the URSO, and because they're in an earlier stage in the disease, they respond biochemically. The alkaline phosphatase drops, but they're still moving along, and they eventually get to the same point. All we've done is identify a patient earlier in the disease process by giving them URSO and seeing an improvement in alkaline phosphatase. So it, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's having an effect on the actual disease progression or rate of progression. I hope that was clear and I didn't confuse myself. And the reason why I say that is based on this result here. This is a, the results of long-term follow-up of a Scandinavian study in, with pa in which patients were given either placebo or urso, and it did not show an impact on outcomes. And then, but they looked at patients uh, later down, down the line, and they divided them into patients that had a normal alkaline phosphatase later <clears throat> and uh, those that didn't. And the two lines up here are the patients that did the best, and they are the ones that normalize their alkaline phosphatase. Now, one of these lines represents patients that got URSO. The other line represents patients that did not get URSO. These two lines represent patients that didn't normalize their alkaline phosphatase. One line is those that got URSO and ones that didn't. So it's normalization of the alkaline phosphatase, not the treatment with URSO that predicts your rate of progression or your risk of an outcome sooner than later. So this would suggest that it's not URSO, but it's just identifying patients earlier in the disease process. The other argument against using URSO is that if URSO works, wouldn't we know it by now? We've been studying it for so long. These are uh, uh, results from a couple of different trials. This was using uh, the typical dose of 13 to 15 milligrams per kilogram that if you're on URSO, you should be on now and no higher. Uh, this was a higher dose used in the Scandinavian study, and basically what these are showing is that there's no difference in outcomes whether you got placebo or urso, and even if you look just at early stage disease, there were no differences. And the Scandinavian study was a relatively long uh, and large study that showed no difference in outcomes. <clears throat> so 
So it didn't work in the US and it didn't work in Scandinavia. And finally, when we, the, uh, with URSA, we have a lot of data to suggest it actually is effective in PBC, and we understand a lot more about URSA use there uh, than in PSC. And what I want to show you here is actually the number of transplants done uh, for the three uh, major autoimmune liver diseases. Uh, in, in blue is PBC. And you'll see that around uh, in the early 1990s, there was a rapid drop in the number of plant transplants done for PBC. And this correlates with the introduction of URSO. So we, we see at least indirect evidence that there is an impact of URSO on the need for liver transplantation for PBC. We don't see a similar drop in numbers of transplants for PSC over that same period. And because we know, that, at least based on the registry data from PSC partners and others, that probably 75% of patients with PSC are taking URSO, if it was having an impact, we would expect to see this drop along the same uh, path that we saw PVC rates drop. Now, of course, there are the unintended consequences, and, and I, I want to stress that this is from very high doses. So this is the 28 to 30 milligrams per kilogram per day or so. This is the dose you definitely do not want to take. The others, yeah, you could take it. Probably doesn't do anything, but it's safe. This, at the higher doses, and this is what we have to be careful about with any therapy, is that we may see that liver tests get better, as was seen in this trial. Liver tests got better with this very high dose of Urso, and so we might think it's doing something better. But in fact, these two lines are different, but the better line in the top here are actually the placebo-treated patients. The patients that did worse were those that got the high dose Urso, and they got better liver tests. And then over here, this actually shows the risk of colon cancer. So it used to be, we thought initially, oh, Verso protects against colon cancer in PSC with IBD. Then uh, the Scandinavian study suggested there was no difference. And then this now with the high dose shows that those that got the high dose Verso actually had a higher risk of developing colon cancer uh, compared to those that got placebo. So whenever we think about things, and we have to think about the weighing the risk and benefits. Um, and so to take URSO, we're thinking we have to weigh, is there actually a benefit of URSO? And I think if there is, it's fairly marginal based on the data available so far. Um, and then the risk of disease progression uh, without it. If we, uh, if we uh, I think I got these backwards. Uh, this should be the risk of, uh, we have to weigh the risk of taking URSO, which probably, as I mentioned, at the, the doses that we typically prescribe now is probably very low, as well as the cost. And where we, you know, come out at the end of the day on this really depends on balancing those uh, two factors. And the reason it's so difficult um, uh, is because the data of benefit is very minimal um, and there is some risk. So uh, because I'm arguing this side, you shouldn't take her, so. But I'll give it to you if you want it. No. <laughs> Well, our next speaker will be arguing that you should take Urso, and that would be Dr. Aparna Gold. She's a uh, general and transplant hepatologist at Stanford University. She's an associate professor of medicines there. She also has uh, research in clinical interest and in management of autoimmune liver diseases. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to discuss the right side of this debate, Dr. Bowles. I'm happy. I was happy when I got the email that he gave me the pro side of the debate. It makes it a lot easier to discuss. Um, but, but like, you know, I, I was initially going to ask if anyone's a PSC or who's been prescribed or so, but I think that I, I, I will we'll leave it blinded for now. So like Dr. Bolas said, what, what is there to debate about? Um, and and the, the, the big questions have been unanswered in terms of the hard clinical endpoints. So does ursodial really decrease your risk of liver transplantation? And does it really improve survival? And I don't think that there's 
good evidence to suggest that because the trial endpoints have been really variable and our studies have yielded different results. And there is a lot of confusion about this um, and you can tell on the forums that a lot of our patients are confused and when they are prescribed Ursodial, they, they look it up and they look up the guidelines and some of the guidelines do recommend it and some of the guidelines don't and it, and it causes some stress and anxiety and, and appropriately so. So our three national guidelines in this country, and the, the three large guidelines, um, the, the American guidelines in, in liver disease, the European guidelines of liver disease um, do differ. So our American guidelines recommend against the use of Ursodial because there has not been a proven benefit. The European guidelines recommend us to use Ursodial, and, and the other American guidelines, the American College of Gastroenterology guidelines, just acknowledge that um, most of us prescribe Ursodial. So uh, there, there is some debate, obviously. What is Ursodial, just so we all know, is that it goes by all of these brand names and you've probably seen it. Uh, it originates from bear bile, and it was initially used to dissolve cholesterol gallstones. And what we can tell is that with Ursodial, and compared to the other natural bile salts that are in our body, it is the least toxic bile salt in our body. And when you do give, when you prescribe Ursodial, you can change this composition of bile salts so that, you know, normally it only represents about three to four percent of the bile acid population um, in, in humans. And when you give the medication, it can increase to over 40 percent. So it changes the composition of your bile salts. So it makes the overall bile salt population and the bile acid population in your body less toxic to the liver cells. So just, just as um, you know, this, most of this uh, data Dr. Bolas had already discussed, but I think I want to give you a little bit of the story behind the confusion and, um, and, and when it is appropriately used, I think. So you know, when Ursodial was used and studied and showed an efficacy for the treatment of the other cholestatic liver disease, PBC, um, in, the, in the late 1980s and the early 1990s, there began to be some interest in studying it for PSC as well. So initially there were small pilot trials that showed um, that, al that the alkaline phosphatase which is this surrogate biomarker of how what we think represents disease activity, um, it showed that ursodial did decrease your alkaline phosphatase levels. And, and it actually, did, there was some evidence that it improved biopsy results as well. This led to the thought that maybe we need to study higher doses of it um, to see if it really does change potential clinical endpoints. So this was a large study that was done in 105 patients where um, they were studied over a two-year period of time. And what we saw was that there was an improvement in liver enzymes. The main enzymes that were measured were alkaline phosphatase, of course, your GGT, which is another marker of cholestatic um, activity, your AST, and your albumin were measured in this study. And um, you know, although they saw that there was an improvement in these liver enzymes, what they didn't, what they couldn't detect was that there was an actual difference in endpoints in terms of liver transplantation, in terms of death progression to cirrhosis based on biopsy results or certain complications that were developed. So this led to the largest clinical trial that was actually, that was done to date. Um, this was done by Dr. Olson of 219 patients. In this, in this study, the thought process was that maybe with higher doses of Ursodial, we'd be able to saturate the bile acid population a little bit more to make it the least toxic as possible. So the important thing to know in this study, which looked at a dose of 17 to 23 milligrams per kilogram of day of ursodial, is that the way that the study was designed was really meant to recruit over 345 patients. And unfortunately, this was the Scandinavian study that Dr. Bolas had, had mentioned. Unfortunately, over a five-year period of time, they were not able to recruit so many patients because it is a rare disease, and um, all, they, they ended up stopping the enrollment a little bit earlier at 219 patients. And what this study found was that the probability of death or liver transplantation in patients that were treated with Ursodial at this dose was 7% over the five-year period versus 11% in the placebo group. So these, these lines do diverge, and you can tell that these are the patients at the top that were treated with Ursodial. These are the patients at the bottom that were treated um, that were on placebo. This, in, in the world of medicine, we all rely on this p-value test and statistical significance. So this showed a trend potentially to improvement, but it did not show statistical improvement or statistical um, significance. So there was a 36% improvement in death or transplant compared to placebo. 
Now, I'll go into this a little bit more in actually my second talk and, and how um, these lines separate, and Dr. Bullis actually separated the lines really well the last time, where, where if you do look at the patients that did well, it was those patients that actually had an improvement in their alkaline phosphatase. So regardless of the arm that you're in, it was the people that had an improvement in their alkaline phosphatase. So in this, and these patients were followed out after 10 years, and this was um, to, you know, to look at was the, was the medication still safe to use and was it tolerable to use. Most patients were able to tolerate this dose of the medication over a 10-year period of time. And again, those patients, this 10-year follow-up study, those patients that did have a response in their alkaline phosphatase did do better over the 10-year period of time compared to those that did not have a response in the alkaline phosphatase. So it goes to suggest that, you know, yes, a reduction in alkaline phosphatase is a, is a surrogate marker, um, and that if you can improve your alkaline phosphatase, then it's probably a good idea, and for some people, ursodiol can do that. And that's what the, this, this data went to suggest. But unfortunately, because it didn't meet the statistical significance, um, there's been this big question in, in, our, in, in a lot of minds about whether or not it truly is effective. So um, you, part of, part of uh, answering that question was also Dr. Lindor's study, which studied the higher doses of ursodial. And I think that this is what put the, um, the, big, the big X on definite high doses are not a good idea. So uh, doses of 28 to 30 milligrams per kilogram of day of ursodial, that, that was a study that was ended early because it did show that at such high doses of ursodial, there was an increased risk of death transplant and potential listing criteria. So Dr. Dr. Bullis had mentioned this earlier that at high doses, we do not give this and that is absolutely not recommended. And it is mainly because at such high doses, the, the, the outcomes are worse in patients with arsodial. So it is absolutely not okay to take higher doses of 28 to 30 milligrams per kilogram a day, but there is a sweet spot. And this is the, the Goldilocks dilemma that we're led in. So you know we know at early, at lower doses of the drug, maybe not the most effective, at very high doses, it's bad, but there probably is a sweet spot where it is safe, and for some people, it'll, it'll likely work to bring their alkaline phosphatase levels down. So this, the, the, the marker that we use to determine, um, in PVC, the marker that we use to determine how active your disease is is definitely alkaline phosphatase. This is the best marker that we have right now for PSC. It is probably not the best that we are eventually going to have, but it is a surrogate marker that we use right now. There is some thought that just because you have a decrease in your alkaline phosphatase doesn't necessarily mean that that is going to yield improved outcomes over the long run, um, which is true in some patients, but I think for the most part, we believe that if your alkaline phosphatase level is reduced, that it likely does lead to improved survival, and this has been confirmed in over five studies over the last two decades or so. So I'll briefly, you know, you, these two lines you all are used to looking at now. So the top lines here, and all of these graphs I'm about to show you, show that when you uh, show a reduced level of alkaline phosphatase, and this means that an alkaline phosphatase reduction of about you know, 40% from your baseline values um, or normalization. And the bottom lines in all these graphs represent when your alkaline phosphatase levels are not reduced. The, the, over time, this, this will represent the survival probability without transplantation in these studies. So in this first study, clear distinction between these two lines. Again, if you have a reduction in your alkaline phosphatase, regardless of what your treatment is, improved survival over the long period. And again, a reduction in your alkaline phosphatase, less than 1.3 times upper limit of normal, compared to ongoing elevation in alkaline phosphatase, improved survival. Again, reduction in your alkaline phosphatase levels, improved survival. And lastly, one more time. So although we don't have the best biomarker available to look at the disease activity for PSC, I think this is a, a good biomarker that represents um, that if you are able to reduce your alkaline phosphatase over time, that your, your um, survival probability without transplantation is better. Now besides looking at just transplantation, what else? Uh, what other beneficial effects does ursodial have? We don't necessarily think that it helps in the world of colon cancer. We, there have been studies that look at the effect of ursodial on liver fibrosis. So in patients that are treated with ursodial at the appropriate doses, 
they're more likely to maintain a lower stage of fibrosis compared to those that are not treated with ursodile. So this represents over a period of four years, patients that had repeat biopsies done within a period of time, that 76% stayed with an early stayed within early stages of fibrosis or scarring in their liver when they were treated with ursodile compared to those that were on placebo. Similarly, when patients were on ursodial, they had a five times lower rate of progression from early to late stages of disease. So only 7%, it was a 7% rate of fibrosis progression per year in the folks that were on ursodial compared to 34% rate of progression in those that were treated, um, with, with those that are on placebo. The other big outcome that um, I think is important to note is that ursodial can potentially decrease the incidence of developing varices um, over a course of time as well. So this was a trial looking at 180 patients that had endoscopy performed every two years, and most of them did not have varices at the, at the entry point into the study. But when they repeated endoscopies over a course of four years, there was a lower incidence of developing varices, a 16% incidence of developing varices if you were treated with ursodial compared to a 58% if you were treated with placebo. So I think that's, that's convincing that there are beneficial effects in terms of both scarring in the liver, in terms of developing potential complications of liver disease. In summary, I think that Dr. Bolas and I would probably both agree, and this is why he gives it to his patients, and most of you will too, um, a decrease in your alkaline phosphatase is beneficial, and ursodial is beneficial in some patients. And it's important to know that it's not going to work for everyone. It's not going to decrease your rate of liver progression or liver disease progression in everyone as well. But with ursodial, at the appropriate doses, at no more than 20 milligrams per kilograms per day, if you have early stages of disease, so early stages of cirrhosis or, or child's A, early cirrhosis, um, and if you can demonstrate a decrease in your alkaline phosphatase, that it is beneficial. So there's also evidence to suggest that in early stages, if you give the medication, it can delay the progression of fibrosis, it can delay the development of varices. So I think in, some po in, a, in a certain population of patients, it really is beneficial. I think for the hard part for a lot of us is that we can't quite identify yet who that perfect population is that it's going to work for. So we give it and we try it in most patients if it is safe to try. I do think the big caveat to this still is that it should be considered in the treatment algorithm, um, but if there are clinical trials that are, being, that are available and are offered to you in your centers, it shouldn't necessarily interfere with enrollment in certain clinical trials for other novel therapies for which there are several um, that I think you'll hear about later today. So, uh, I think that for, for the purposes of our current standard of care, it's certainly beneficial um, and it should be in the algorithm for treatment. Thank you.